Good afternoon, everyone. Um, quite a windy, overcast day here in Gauteng. Welcome. Um, we seem to be having a few, I seem to be having a few problems with my connections and my internet and my feed. Um, so please let me know if you can see me and if you can hear me. Um, otherwise, we might have to reschedule. Um, okay, so today's topic his pain and pain in dogs and we can cross reference to cats too if there are any questions um yeah pain is an interesting one i think we've got to begin with you know what is pain so if you if you look at the literature and you look at how they define pain in humans they they define it as an event which causes um which obviously causes pain within the body. So it's, it stimulates the pain receptors, but not always. There is also always an emotional component. And so we can perceive something to be painful, even though it's not painful. And we're even removing, you know, there's, there's the emotional component. Well, that's what we're talking about. The emotional component to pain is huge. And hi, Sam, thank you. Um, I think that the big aspect here to consider or to, well, what I believe is that our dogs are emotional beings and therefore they have the capacity to even um, predict pain. And then we start getting some changes in their behavior. So my little poodle is a perfect example. Um, we have done so much work with her here in the rehab center um, that even now when we try to, if she thinks we're going to do anything with her that's work-related, because she's had surgeries, <laughs> hi, Lindy, because she's had surgeries, she immediately starts to shiver and shake and she wants to hide away. And yes, I'm sure there are behavioral people that, will, that can argue what I'm going to say now um, and that it's a learned behavior, but she has an emotional component to what she experienced when she had the surgeries. And then we worked with her and she was sore during that time. There's no doubt that surgery creates a pain. And what we were asking her to do was also painful. And so now she anticipates that if we're gonna work with her, there is pain. Okay, so pain is very complex um, and pain is um, perceived differently by every individual. And I believe that to be true for our animal companions as well. So we can't, blanket um, uh, define, but I think it is important just to be aware that yes, there's a physical component, but there's an emotional component as well. And then the next thing that we need to look at, hello Carol, the next thing that we need to look at is the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. And I think acute pain is very easy for all of us to recognize. Um, you know, um, we cut our finger, it's acutely sore. It's in the moment and it's painful. And then we bandage it up, we put a plaster on, we get stitches and the pain subsides because the healing process um, is, is set in motion and that wound can repair. So dogs will also suffer from acute pain in a similar way. You know, they have a dog fight, they have a wound, there's gonna be pain. Okay. I think more importantly, what we're referring to here is chronic pain. And chronic pain is when pain responses in the body have become maladapted and or the receptors are constantly being um, triggered. And so our animals and our indeed humans as well begin to suffer from chronic pain. So that is pain by definition that is present for more than 60 days. So once you have been in pain every day for 60 days, by definition, you are suffering from chronic pain. Okay, and, and when we look at our dogs and, and we look at this topic, I think the chronic pain is of way more importance and significance than the acute pain. Because the chronic pain is what our companions, our dogs and our cats um, hide. And so how do we actually... Um, how do we know if they saw? So, hello, Shanaza Rescue. Thanks for joining us, Chris. 
Um, and so what, what is really evident for me or what is over the years is, you know, we, I will often hear, but my dog's not whining, my dog's not yelping, my dog's not crying. How do I know if my dog's sore? Surely if it was sore, it would cry out. And my answer to you is no. That is an incorrect assumption. Dogs are predators. Dogs are designed to hide pain. In fact, a lot of our animals are designed to hide pain. And so by expressing it vocally, they are um, actually indicating a weakness. So most of our dogs will only cry when it's extremely sore. Not all of them, um, but most of them. And so what can you look for uh, and to determine whether or not your dog is in pain? So first of all, we've got to look for the physical. Okay, there could be changes in the way your dog walks. So it might not be an overt lameness. There can be limping and lameness as well, but there could be changes in the way your dog carries itself. So if we're looking at um, chronic uh, patella luxation, that can create pain in the knees and the dog will shift its weight forward um, so as not to engage the back legs to the same level that it would normally. And so that shift and that change is one of the indications that there's pain. Um, limping is another. If we're looking at joints and areas over the body, they can be swollen, they can be hot to the touch, they can be tender. So those are physical manifestations of pain. Some of them are associated more with acute pain, but we can certainly get it with chronic pain. Some of the dogs can show increased levels of anxiety like, um, like Shami does. Um, in the more chronic um, lots of pain, the... Um, some of the dogs like really high levels of chronic pain. Some of the dogs may actually pace at night. It's often around about 1 or 2 um, a.m. And they can also be chewing or biting and licking at a painful area. Um, so those are the physical things that we see. Moving on from the physical, closely related to physical, is mobility. So what happens with your dog's mobility? Many of the dogs are slow to rise and they take a while to warm up. And this is particularly true for um, osteoarthritis. But you could, you could notice that your dogs are reluctant to follow you from one room to another. You know, most of our, uh, our dogs, they don't want us, they don't want to leave our sides. And so we're moving through the house and the dogs are moving with us. But if your dog suddenly um, slows down and rather waits to see whether you're coming back, that could be an indication that there's pain. Um, specifically with the arthritis, you will see that dogs, um, dogs with arthritis are slow to rise in the mornings and then once they warm up and they move around and we get those joints moving, which is why the movement and the mobility for the older dogs is so important, then some of that pain subsides and for a large portion of the day, they're actually quite mobile. Um, dogs may rest more. So, you know, where they used to always be ready for a game and go out, they may decide that they want to sleep more. They are slower on walks. The distances they're able to walk are shorter. So these are all indications that the dog may be in pain. Um, there's also maybe a reluctance to stretch. So if you think that your dog in the mornings would maybe normally stretch itself awake, uh, maybe do a bit of a play bow, bum in the air, come back, um, my chamois likes to stretch back her back legs. Um, those movements may actually stop. So a lot of it is dependent on what do you observe and what is normal for your dog. The other things with regards to mobility is your dog might have difficulty coming up and down the stairs now. Okay, so or they may stumble more frequently, and they also might not want to be able to get might not want to get into the car. They might be unable to get into the car. Okay, so those are all changes in mobility that could give you a hint that your dog is um, in pain. And then moving on from the mobility, so we've got physical things that you might feel and see. You've got mobility changes, changes in mobility that you might become aware of. And now we're looking at behavior. So we definitely do get behavioral changes as a result of, um, of chronic pain. Your dog might stop playing with the, other, with the other pets or with the other dogs, it might avoid the rough play. 
It might choose to go and lie down. Dogs may, in fact, isolate themselves. Cats definitely isolate themselves when they sore, and they sleep a lot more. Cats do. Hard to say when cats are sleeping 18 hours out of 24, but now they might be sleeping 21 out of 24. Um, I jest. Uh, they will isolate themselves. They may actually become um, a bit snappy, a little bit aggressive um, to other dogs and, in fact, to people as well, particularly children. So be aware that if you have younger children in the house and they're moving towards the dog and suddenly your wonderful Labrador is um, growling, please don't be angry with the Labrador. It's a red flag to say, what's going on? Maybe there is some pain and maybe my dog doesn't want my boisterous child jumping on it. So just be aware of that as well. There could be, certainly with cats, a decrease in grooming. So your cat's fur could start to become matted. They also don't want to be touched. So they, they may shy away from the normal cuddles and pets and petting that you would be doing um, and, uh, and giving them. Um, for dogs and for cats, you might find inappropriate elimination. So the cats might be missing the litter tray. They might be urinating or defecating outside of the litter tray because they can't get in anymore. They can't bend um, or they can't go through that process um, to actually position themselves in the litter tray. What I find with a lot of the older dogs is um, because movement is painful, they will hold on and hold on and hold on before they actually go out to, to do their business. And then by the time they realize, man, I'm in trouble, I better get out there, it's too late. And so they will urinate or defecate in the passage on the way to the front door. Okay, so again, um, if you become aware of the fact that they're not doing it on purpose, it's not necessarily always a willful behavior. It's a behavior often associated with pain and a reduction in mobility. Um, so I think that covers changes in behavior. Oh, we may have vocalization um, on handling. So if you pick them up, they may actually squeal or um, cats may, may moan. You know, cats can be very adamant. They can certainly get their messages across. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about that may change is weight, and it can go either way. So the weight may drop because the pain could be causing um, a poor appetite. On the flip side, the, the weight may go up because of the, uh, because your dog is moving less, so your dog is burning fewer calories. So um, it's, not, it's, it's often not only one thing. It's often a number of things that start to fit together to give you a picture that maybe my dog is actually not very comfortable. Okay, so um, those are, and yeah, it could be one, it could be three, it could be the whole lot, um, but I think if you become aware and if you, if you if you understand that pain is chronic pain is presented in dogs in a different way to what we expect, then you can be alerted to it if it starts to develop in um, one of your one of your companions. Um, the other thing that pain may cause chronic pain is depression. So think about the people that you know that are in chronic pain. Many of them show signs of depression. Same with your dogs. Okay. So in the next few minutes, I think, are there any questions about, um, about how your dog might actually show signs of pain? Uh, if those come into the feed, then I will, I will answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, I think what I, what, I want to, what I want to look at now is how do we manage that pain? Okay, so we've touched on some of those topics um, through the course of the last few weeks. We've looked at what do we do with older dogs. We've looked at some massage techniques. We've looked at some acupressure points, and um, those are for calming, but um, there are acupressure points for pain as well, um, which will assist. We've looked at skin rolls, and we've looked at passive range of motion. So there's a number of, of things that you can do um, that will assist with pain. And those all fall under therapies, uh, physiotherapies, physical rehabilitation. Um, for the most part, vets refer to um, pain management these days now as being multimodal. 
um, or multifaceted. So it's, it's not sufficient anymore to simply be using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Okay, so when we look at the pathways of pain, if we have inflammation, so remember when I said we have arthritis, itis, um, thanks Angela, welcome, all the way from Cape Town. Um, if we have itis, it indicates that there is inflammation. Okay, arthritis, myositis, um, gingivitis, they all indicate inflammation. And when we have inflammation, we very often have pain. Okay, or inflammation is responsible for a large portion of the pain that we feel and that our dogs and cats also feel. So the first thing that the vets are going to prescribe is an anti-inflammatory. Okay, it's the first thing doctors prescribe, okay, is an anti-inflammatory because of the fact that that inflammatory cascade is fundamental. It's part of the entire process of pain, okay. So before you throw out the anti-inflammatory because of its side effects, we need to look at how do we use anti-inflammatories in a complete holistic program, okay. So the first thing the vets are going to do is they're going to give your animal an anti-inflammatory. The second thing that happens is if the anti-inflammatory, from a vet's perspective, if the anti-inflammatory is not as effective as it could be, then we start adding opioids. Opioids are the drugs that work like morphine. So they work on morphine receptors. So the anti-inflammatories work on the inflammatory cascade in the body. The opioids work on morphine receptors in the body and, they morph and those receptors will assist in reducing pain on a different level, on a different mechanism. Then there are tricyclic antidepressants, which work on the central nervous system, which will also, when we've got chronic pain, we have overstimulation of the nervous system. And the dog and the human, in fact, can sometimes go into what we call wind up. So in those instances, we may well be using something that is going to suppress that overreactivity of the nervous system. Okay. The, th the fourth thing that we use is something which is called um, a GABA. I, I never remember if it's an agonist or an antagonist, but these are things like epleptin, gabapentins um, specifically. So epleptin is a trade name. Um, very often anti-epileptic drugs in humans um, and, uh, and so they also work on the central nervous system, but in a slightly different way to the antidepressants. And so we can use up to five different drugs to manage chronic pain. Okay. And, and, and in fact, in some of our animals, we should be because we all have a right to a pain-free existence. Okay. Moving on from the drugs, I want to look at what else can we do? to assist with pain management. Um, nice comment, Carol. Yeah, so you notice how aggressive he was. Um, so the disc was probably already starting to put some pressure on, um, on the spine. Um, what else can we use? So there are a lot of homeopathic remedies and each one is going to be specific for a different condition. I like to use a homeopathic combination that's referred to as RRA for arthritis. Rus, Ruta, and Arnica, and um, I do keep it in stock. I call it arthritis remedy. Many human homeopaths will be able to make up a, um, a formula for, for your dogs. Um, so we can look at homeopathy. We can look at cannabis and uh, cannabidiol, so full plant extracts as well as cannabidiol only, and that is a topic completely on its own. Um, but definitely uh, they will assist with pain management. Depending on which one you use, you need to just be aware of side effects in your dog because the THC can cause side effects in your dog. Then there are other products like um, chondroprotectants, so your joint um, supplements that contain glucosamine and chondroitin, often omega-3s. Omega-3s and omega-6s are very strong anti-inflammatories. Okay, so if your dog has arthritis, then we need to be using a joint supplement because it means that you will use less of the drug or the medicine. Okay, so now we're starting to look at multimodal. We need to keep your animal walking. We need to make sure that your dog is not overweight. 
because the weight puts extra pressure on those joints every time your dog moves. Okay, so it's not simply drugs. There's a lot of things that you can do that are going to assist with managing um, your dog's pain. Uh, MSM is another supplement. Um, it's a very strong anti-inflammatory. Green-lipped muscle extract. Um, just trying to think of the things that I often get asked about. Um, curcumin. Curcumin, um, so that's what we find in turmeric, and there's been a lot of social media posts on the golden paste, okay? Turmeric, um, curcumin has been researched and definitely does assist with reducing inflammation. So, yeah, there's plenty of things that you can use as supplements along with um, your, uh, your mainstream drugs. The last thing that I want to say is that we actually use a, a chronic pain assessment form that you can fill in and it gives a score. So you can come in, your dog has chronic pain, you fill in the form, I think the score is out of 30. And let's say your dog's starting pain is 16 out of 30, okay, based on the questionnaire. While we work with your dog, we want to be certain that it stays at 16 or goes lower. If it goes higher, so we can redo these pain questionnaires every month, every six weeks, as frequently as you ask, um, as it gets better, or as it, if, it, if that pain score increases, then it means that we need to look at additional things um, to use in managing your dog's pain. Dog's pain is getting worse. Okay, so it's not always about observing. There are things that, you know, we have got questionnaires and scales that we can use in practice to assist with determining the level of pain. I think the big thing is don't think that just because your dog is not crying that your dog doesn't have any pain. Okay, right. I hope this has been helpful. Um, Eileen, is it better to give um, morning or evening supplements? Um, Eileen, I think... Huh, I think that depends on the dog and I think it depends on the level active of activity and I think it also depends on um, whether you're feeding two meals a day or not. Some of the supplements need to be given with a meal, in which case if you're giving morning and evening, it's not going to matter. Um, if your dog is very, very active, my suggestion would be to give it in the morning. Um, so that you've got, <laughs> hello, hello baby, so that you've got, um, you've got those supplements working already um, during the course of the day. If your dog is a nighttime pacer because of pain, then maybe it's better to give those supplements at night. Okay, so I think, um, I think that, you know, as with everything that I do, there's not, there's not a blanket recipe, there's just not a recipe we need to be looking at what works. And sometimes with these pain medications in closing and supplements, it's trial and error. What works for one dog doesn't work for another dog. Okay, so you need to try a few things. You need to try them for a period of time. You need to be very aware of your dog's behavior. Um, and then if the behavior stays the same, you could conclude over three or four weeks, oh, it wasn't effective. Okay. Um, oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Sandra Mitchley, can I exchange the pet cam for golden paste or CBD oil? Um, I think that depends on your dog. Um, and I know Max has been um, in quite a lot of pain and we definitely need to put in a whole lot of other things before we can reduce the pet cam dose. Okay, so I never advocate a sudden stop in an anti-inflammatory. I always say, let's add some exercises, let's build up some muscle, Let's see if we can add, you can use CBD in conjunction with an anti-inflammatory and the same as the golden paste. The only exclusion to that I think would be devil's claw. I think it works on the same pathways as an anti-inflammatory. Okay, so we need to work with you and your dog in, um, in, order, to, um, in order to figure out what's going to work best for him. Um, yeah, Denise, thanks for that. Pip was better at night, otherwise she woke up sore and it took a while for her um, for it to kick in and to get going. So this is, this is saying exactly what I've said. It's very dependent on the individual dog. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the responses. I hope you found it useful. And um, please feel free to share. 
I think it is valuable for this information. If you found it valuable, I think it's really valuable for this information to get out there um, and to let's start conversations. So tomorrow is Good Friday and we have a whole long Easter weekend. So I won't be live again until Tuesday at 12. So thank you very much for your responses, for your attention, and please stay safe, stay sane, have a very, very blessed Easter. Lots and lots of love to all of you.